don't applaud, I have bad news for you. I know it is after lunch and all of you are a little bit... <laughs> so I'm going to employ every terrible technique in my handbag to keep you awake. So there's going to be singing and audience participation, and there's even a terrible slide of a light bulb. <laughs> As Andy said, I'm Crystal Beasley. I founded a company called QCut. I don't know if you have a throne, but I have a throne, and it's one ton of Italian denim. Uh, my company, QCut, makes women's jeans in 400 sizes, and this is the audience participation part. So ladies in the audience, I want you to make the sound that is what you feel going into a dressing room to try on a pair of jeans in three, two, one. Uh. It's an everyday problem, finding a pair of jeans that fit. In 2016, how do we not have pants that fit? I don't know, it's crazy. Um, so QCut uses algorithms to match you. It's a, all about the experience. And um, if you take nothing away from QCut, um, I want it to be that I've, I've literally spent the last 18 months putting jeans on women, thousands, I think we're almost up to a thousand women, and there is no such thing as a normal body. It's actually the whole system of standardized clothing that's broken. There is not a single woman that goes into a dressing room and thinks, oh yeah, these are great, I'll just take these. Um, so it's not, about, um, it's not about you being broken, it's the industry. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about digital maturity, and this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart because I'm building a digitally mature apparel company. We're gonna do a, um, an open house on Friday the 22nd. I'm actually not gonna talk much about QCut, but come by on Friday and check us out and experience our whole process. Digital maturity is meaning that your product or service has actually been fully transformed by the internet. We are, give or take, 20 years in, to the internet being a thing. And what's surprising about this is that not everybody is digitally mature. Industries are transforming at different rates. And the goal of this talk is to give you a lens to find the missed opportunities in whatever business you are already in or inspiration to start a new one. Um, this all became, this all started with a provocation of whether Uber is a taxi company or a tech company. And at first, the question annoyed me, and I thought it was really obvious and boring. And I was talking to my friend, Marshall Kirkpatrick, and he said, no, that's actually a really interesting question. And I was still kind of annoyed by it. And then investors kept asking me, is QCut a tech, uh, an apparel company or a tech company? And <laughs> this little bee buzzed around my head enough times that uh, I actually decided it was a really interesting and important question because literally my company is getting valued based on the answer to that question. But what's interesting is that if you're not building a digitally mature company, then you are facing a really uphill road because if you're not future-proof, you're a commodity. And if it can be sold on Amazon without a significant degradation to the experience, then it will be. And if you aggregate the profit margins across all of retail, it nets out to 4%. So once you've taken everybody, the cost of the goods and, and all of the salaries and shipping and all of the cost that it takes to get a product into a customer's hands, you have 4% left over. And that's such a narrow margin that you don't want to be in that business, probably. I want you to take a couple seconds and think about a tech company that has positively impacted your life in the last week. Your answers might be something like this. I would suggest to you that Skype is a video platform. It solves the everyday problem of wanting to talk to somebody you like across the world. This is getting you from point A to B. This is entertaining you during your workout. Instagram's photo sharing. Facebook's, well, Facebook. And Uber's actually a taxi company. 
But before we go too much further into the future, it's important to look at the lessons from the past. Um, this is what it looked like in 1915 to be a farmer. Not awfully long ago. In 1915, 55 cities in the world had a power grid. And this point in time, I'm lining up to 1995 when the internet was just coming about and people were getting networked for the first time. It took decades to see the potential of electrification, but I think we would all agree that if you didn't figure out how to use electricity in your business, that your business wasn't gonna continue. And the same is true of digital technology now. And now we're at the singing part, you ready? <laughs> um, we're gonna go down to Electric Avenue. This is Electric Avenue, 1889. We figured out uh, the light bulb pretty quickly and in 1889 in London, Electric Avenue was the first uh, publicly illuminated market. Now we're at the light bulb. Are you even at a conference if you're not <laughs> getting a, a slide of a light bulb? But this is not about the, uh, the cheap metaphor of the light bulb for an idea. I'm actually talking about light bulbs because uh, media was one of the very first, oh, that's exciting. Media is one of the very first industries to figure out technology and to embrace it. They put that light bulb into a projector and built the whole golden age of cinema. Um, Edison Kinetogram, if you can just imagine for yourself that this is the first film company. It is an electric film company. Thomas Edison owned and founded it. <laughs> um, 1910, Frankenstein was one of the very first movies. And in 1922, once the power grid now is underway and San Francisco had a power grid, uh, they used those, that power to put people's name up in lights. And fun fact, limelight really means light that was made out of a lime, <laughs> the limelight. Anyway, history's funny. And then everybody started to figure out, all right, electricity, what's it good for? Let's put it in everything. Let's put it in the electric belt. Let's put it in the electric corset. What, what is happening? <laughs> she has a cold, much like myself, and this happens to be an ozone inhaler. I don't know why it didn't catch on. Uh, and then there's electric soap. Um, in the same absurdity, I just want you to turn your lens on how absurd we, this moment today is where we describe everything as tech. It's just as silly as this. Um, and in the same sense that people had to learn how to use electricity to mix the soap, um, we must use tech to figure out how to make our soap. It took three decades, however, to get to agriculture. Agriculture is one of those very slow industries. It wasn't until the 30s and 40s with a government-sponsored um, program to promote electricity in the farm that it actually started to change that industry in a meaningful way. And indeed, there was a massive cultural shift at that time as people were moving away from the shrinking farm jobs into cities, and those became the manufacturing jobs transformed and made available by electricity. I'm also pandering to you because you're a crowd of designers and that's gorgeous. <laughs> so we're, the, we're very, very close to the point now we're calling something tech or digital. It's just not saying anything very useful at all. Um, it didn't take very long before you were just buying a hairdryer, not an electric hairdryer. And no one would say, QCut is an electric company. You should invest in QCut because we use electricity to sew your jeans. Um, Ladies, this is what was before the hairdryer. I just had to show you this because you heated that in the stove and I don't even, that's bad. Okay, so fast forward it to 1931, Frankenstein came out again and what's useful about this poster is that there's no mention whatsoever of electricity being how the film was made. It's just about the story. And the lesson here is to focus on the medium that you are actually in. 
I don't have a point on this slide. I just love you, and I want you to be happy and see amazing things. I could just, we'll just look at this for a while because it's awesome. <laughs> Um, so digital maturity comes at different stages to different industries, and it has this funny um, marker. If you know you're very, if you're in the very beginning of a transition, and companies are struggling to stand out, they're using electricity as a differentiator. Electrolux, it's a vacuum cleaner. It's not an electricity company, but we have the same thing with iPhone, iHome, eBay, Elance, eHarmony, NetJet, Netflix, Netscape. But we don't do that anymore. So no, don't do that. Don't, don't name your company after the technology. That's not appropriate anymore. You sound like you're 10 years behind. Um, but bolt-on is this, um, this point at which we haven't quite figured it out. It's the ugly adolescent stage. Uh, we're just tacking it on to existing stuff. And I'll pick on the travel industry because Expedia, they were just a distributor. And the internet's really good at distributing things. So the very first step into the internet is to take a thing that we already have and then figure out how to distribute it with the internet. It's the same old flight. It's the same old hotel room. Built in is when the product or service itself is fully transformed into a different experience. And Airbnb is the example for this for the hotels. For your $100 a night, which one makes you want to go to Spain more? I know it's Airbnb for me. But there's two important markers of built-in digital maturity. The first is culture. And in Airbnb's case, it wasn't clear that people really wanted to stay in a stranger's house. This shift was something that they had to actually go out and market and test and find out whether people were willing to do this. And the second marker of digital maturity is economics, because they're actually changing who the money goes to at this point. And it's no longer going to the hotels. And sometimes they're not paying taxes to city, so it causes this, you know, this buzz of, is this okay? What are we doing? What do we as a culture think about that? The second industry, again, is going to be going back to media, because media was early in the tech revolution as well. Um, Netflix was founded in 1997, and it IPO'd in 2002. That's such a long time ago <laughs> in, in the internet time frame. Uh, but they also are interesting because they transitioned from bolt-on to built-in. They started with the distri distribution of DVDs. And it wasn't at all clear that the transition when they went to streaming was actually going to work. It was a very difficult time for the company. And again, it wasn't even that long ago. Um, I'm going to read from a bit of The Atlantic from 2011. 2011. Although streaming maybe, maybe the future. The future isn't here. Removing your company's name on a product, oh, this was Quickster. Do you guys remember Quickster? They were going to split their business into the DVD by mail on one side and streaming on the other because they were running two completely different businesses, much like this odd, I'm not, you guys can't see that, I'm pointing that, this, the light, that's another light bulb. This is an electric and gas fixture because we're not sure if the electricity is actually going to be on all the time, so we're going to have the gas as a backup, kind of like the internet's real crappy, and I want to watch some Allie McBeal, and so we might need to trans over to the DVD. Um, yeah, so although streaming may be the future, the future isn't here. Removing your company's name on a product that is doing well now, which was the DVD service, and leaving it solely on the product you hope will succeed one day seems like an ill-advised strategy. We'll have to wait for the company's third quarter numbers to see how the streaming subscriptions are faring. It's just hilarious to me, this is 2011. Oh, and by the way, the USPS was delivering more data by mail at one point than the broadband internet was, because it was so crappy. Um, <laughs> So the cultural shift that happened in that transition was binge watching. But the economics in the, in the transition to streaming didn't massively change, although they started to change. But then they became fully digital when they started creating their own content. And the economics at that point massively shifted because they're literally moving the production out of these and completely cutting them out of the value chain. 
It's also important because they're doing more diverse shows. They're doing shows with women and older women, and I still think they could do with some more diversity, but at least it's in the right direction. Bill Derushi told me not to say the future is boring. He told me to say the future is every day. Um, I think we over-rotate on the shiny, and we have too much of an idea of this jetpack future, but there's a lot of really interesting problems that still haven't been solved. I have a cold. Healthcare, not digitally mature. Not, 2016, not. Zoom care is one of the first trying to make some steps in the right direction. Um, cultural changes that you can't change your, you can't choose your doctor, you schedule same day. But the economics are totally vertical and, again, cutting out existing entrenched in interests. Another everyday problem, my old mattress is super gross. I'm on my period. I'm hungry. I got to drive somewhere. Um, what's interesting about these, these are all digitally mature, vertical, direct-to-consumer products. and they're all taking on uh, this vertical model and cutting out the entrenched interests. And what happens when you do that and you succeed, first they just dismiss you, uh, is that they, they fight. So Tesla is prohibited from selling direct to consumer in some number of states. But it's not, that's not a bad sign. It's just a sign that you're doing something that's actually new and interesting. So that's the third. There's culture, there's economics, then there's, this is hard. There are still agriculture, airlines, government, finance, lots of problems that aren't digitally mature. I want to fly to New York today instead of tomorrow. Can't. I'm a farmer who has 100 trees worth of mangoes rotting in the field, and I need a market to sell them in. Not solved. I'm a migrant farm worker who wants to call my home to talk to my family in Ecuador, but the phone cards are really expensive, and I don't have a car to drive and buy one. There's so many everyday problems that need solutions. I would encourage you, my challenge to you is to pick something, one of those problems that's personally important to you. For me, QCUT was founded to pay living wages and to sell to women in a way that supports their self-esteem. And it is gonna get really, really hard. And the only thing that's gonna keep you still moving forward, is to connect with that problem in a very serious way. Uh, when I feel like it's impossible, because no one's ever done this before, I think about the faces of my sewers that make my jeans, that don't have to work three jobs and worry about where their kids are gonna get fed. So whatever it is for you, whether it's changing the culture or the economics, fall in love with a problem and go out there and make a company worth a damn.